know, this is a I know almost nothing about this. <laughs> <laughs> I see nothing. Yeah. So, but you really are in the So, highly recommend it. And since I've gotten to know you the last couple of days, I'm like really, really excited that you're here. And I'm really, really excited to get your experience and your presentation. And so, thank you for being persistent and being, and being willing. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited to be here. I am passionate about teaching anatomy and I'm passionate about playing the cycle, so I'm going to teach and share with you things that I love. Um, this course, or this take on anatomy, grew out of my frustration with lack of anatomy in my cranial cycle courses. Uh, I remember after one anatomy class, there was the talk of the ventricles, but I couldn't conceptualize in a three-dimensional way what were the ventricles. So I was on this mission and searched and searched online and was looking at different pictures and trying to, to put it together in my own brain. And finally came across there was a ventricle model that was cast from uh, human ventricles. And I was just thrilled to finally be able to hold ventricles in my hand and be able to get a sense of what they are. So this work has grown out of my frustration and from what I've heard from other therapists that I've worked with, a general frustration of not being quite sure what's underneath your hands and not being able to form as clear a picture as you would like to when you have your hands on someone. And there's a beautiful quote that I came across, Ursula Popp, who's a cranial sacral therapist. The more I know about anatomy, physiology, and pathology, the better I can focus on the various structures and listen. By listening with inner stillness, by putting my fingers and my intention precisely on these structures, they start guiding me in the treatment, expressing their discomfort, their compression, or their happiness. They will also tell me what they need. And in my silent, skillful, accepting the structures can find optimal positioning and functioning. This is not about manipulation because I, the practitioner, know what is best. This is about allowing the body to find its own expression and its own fluid movement. Who would want to be manipulated anyway? <laughs> so that's what this, these, this time that we have together is designed to help paint a clearer picture for you of the structures that are underneath your hands. Specifically, we're going to be talking about the intracranial membranes, the ventricles, and we're going to also be talking about fluids because there's been some really fascinating new research that's come out that Michelle mentioned um, about the glymphatics, and I don't know if any everybody here has seen it, but I want to talk about that, and then we're going to do some experiential work because my whole mission is that you get the anatomy, you then tune into it in yourself, and then you take it, and when you put hands on, you have an internal reference point for it that now you're able to better apply and better map when you get your hands on someone. Okay? So, here we have the intracranial membranes, the falks and the tent. And we've got the tent is the horizontal, or the folks is the vertical. So it divides left and right hemispheres of your cerebral cortex. And then we have the tent is the horizontal that divides the occipital lobe sit on top and the cerebellum sits underneath. Okay? Here you can see in this photo underneath the tent is the fault cerebelli, which divides the left and right hemispheres of the cerebellum. And there you have a better picture. This is a posterior view of the membranes, okay? So you're looking at the back of the head. Now, reference this on your own selves. Palpate, you've got your external occipital protuberance, that bump at the back of your head. That is So, false intent intersect. If you could put your finger through there, 
that's where they intersect. All right? And there's the folks cerebelli. All right, now one of the big things I want to, to convey to you in terms of membranes is that the membranes envelop and contain the bones, okay? So we have the periosteum, which lines the cranium and makes up the fascial layer that lines the cranium. And it's the dura inside the cranium that makes up the periosteum. There are actually two layers to the dura. There's a periosteal layer and there's a meningeal layer. Now you can't separate them. That meningeal layer peels off to form the folks and the tent. So it's a continuation of what lines the cranium that then invaginates, shall we say, to form the folks and the tent. And then from there, around the foramen magnum, continues down as the dural tube to then anchor on the sacrum at S2. It then, the dural tube, joins with a structure called the phylum terminale at the very end of the, not the, the end of the spinal cord, but then you've got the cauda equina, that horse's tail that fans off, off the end of the spinal cord. That phylum terminale travels down, it's a piece of fibrous connective tissue that helps to stabilize the spinal cord. So the dura blends with the phyl phylum terminale, helps to form the sacral coccygeal ligament. It then blends around the coccyx to form the periosteum of the coccyx. And then we've got fibers from that periosteum of the coccyx that blend into the pelvic floor. So we have this container that travels from cranium to pelvic floor. So when you have your hands on a cranium and you're tuning into the folks and the tent and you're tracking down the dural tube, from here at the cranium, you have a connection to the pelvic floor through the fascia. All right? Wow. Yeah, wow, indeed. Um, so the, on this slide, we've got the three layers, the dura, as I mentioned, the arachnoid layer. Underneath the arachnoid is the, what's between the pia and the arachnoid? Subarachnoid space, yes. And that's going to be relevant when we start talking about fluids more. But that's where the majority of cerebral spinal fluid is contained within the subarachnoid space. And we've got those little trabeculi, which are little anchor fibers that help um, anchor the arachnoid to the pia. Also, know that there are blood vessels. There are arteries that travel through the subarachnoid space. That's also going to be relevant. All right. What's this? Spine. Name, name this bone. It's an ethmoid. An ethmoid. Yeah. Looks like cookie dough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on the ethmoid, we have the cruciform plate, and the crystagalli sticks up in yellow, so it sticks up off the cruciform plate. Why is the crystagalli relevant? It's so where the faults attaches. Yep, you got it. The anterior, the anterior attachment point for the faults is. Right there. Okay? Deep. And the fulx sits inside the notch of the frontal bone, the ethmoid notch of the frontal bone. Sorry, the ethmoid sits inside the ethmoid notch of the frontal bone. And just also notice how deep the frontal bone sits. We tend to think of the frontal bone as right here, but it's deep. It makes up the roof of your orbits. And
then the fault travels up that midline vertical suture, not a suture at that point, in newborns it's a suture, that would be the metopic suture, travels up the frontal bone under the sagittal suture of the parietals, and then down the vertical midline of the occiput. And then we have the tent attaching at the horizontal midline of the occiput. And I thought it was fascinating when Tammy talked yesterday about crosses and points of transition. How about that? Think about that next time you hold an occiput. <laughs> All right, the tent travels, all right, so we have, okay, we've got the horizontal line on the occiput. It also picks up there the inferior corner of the parietals, which we don't tend to think of, the tent attaching on the parietals. And then, um, and then it travels along the petrous ridge of the temporal bone, reaches up to the anterior and posterior clinoid processes of the sphenoid, which make up the front and back of the cell intersico, which is where? Pituitary. Pituitary. Pituitary, yes. All right? And then there's another membrane there called the diaphragm cellae, which covers the cella tersica and is perforated by the infundibulum, that stalk of, that attaches to the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. right? Questions about any of this? All right. So you can start to see, or I'm reminding you, because I know this is review for a lot of you, but painting the picture in a little more detail how connected everything is. So even if you just have your hands on an occiput, you can travel the world, so to speak, from there. All right, here I added in the ventricles. I want to do a caveat with this photo because none of these models were meant for each other. <laughs> okay? So the fit is <clears throat> approximate, but it's good enough to give you a sense. So we have the, <coughs> there we've got the faults attaching on the crystal of the ethmoid. We've got the anterior tips of the tent attaching on either side of the cella tersica. Mm. And then you can start to see how the ventricles fit in with the membranes. And we'll be looking at the ventricles in more detail. And here we are looking from above. Also keep in mind, I love models. I love anatomy models. But they also tend to give us a false sense of what the tissues are really like. The tissues are not hard. They're not plastic. They're not a perfectly straight line. They're pliable. They're juicy. They're alive. They're vital. And we miss that. Um, sometimes when we're applying a model to a cranium. Also keep in mind throughout this that people vary. So anatomy is great, I love netters, I love all these things, but there are anomalies that people have within them. So above all else, trust your hands, that your hands are the true authority. And yes, I love anatomy, and yes, it's fabulous, and know your anatomy backwards, forwards, and trust what's underneath your hands. All right. And then here is the orientation. You can see there's the ring of fascia that goes around the frame and magnum of the occiput. There's the orientation of somebody relying on your table face pointing up towards the ceiling.
Okay, now let's take a look at ventricles. One of the things to keep in mind with ventricles, they connect to all of the lobes of the cortex. So they make contact with the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes. Also, keep in mind with ventricles, they're some of the earliest spaces to develop within us. The ventricles start to develop around 20 to 24 days gestation. So before most women even know they're pregnant, we've got ventricles starting to form. And it's fascinating to tune into ventricles and travel the time-space continuum back to that embryological state. And if you have infants that are really disorganized, that had a lot of trauma, that had a lot going on, holding their ventricles from that place can be a really valuable reset point for them. Does that make sense? So we have the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle. You got two lateral ventricles, left and right. Anterior horn reaches into the frontal lobe of the brain. The body of the lateral ventricle travels underneath the parietal lobes. This is in your notes too, by the way. The posterior horn of the ventricles connects to the occipital lobe of the cortex. Interestingly, the uh, posterior horns are the ones that have the greatest variability in size and may be the, what did I read? I think the right one tends to be longer compared to the left. You don't know why? A uh, little trivia for you. <laughs> then we have the inferior horn cups down inside of the temporal lobes of the brain. It's the inferior one. Lying between the enclosed within the thalamus, which is a deep brain structure that processes sensory information, is the third ventricle. And then down between, this is the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle lies the cerebellum are, make up the back portion of the fourth ventricle, and the pons makes up the front portion. The pons in the upper part of the medulla make up the front of the fourth ventricle. So again, to orient you, if you have your <coughs> external occipital protuberance, and if the cerebellum sit underneath the tent, in front of the cerebellum is your fourth ventricle. All right. So here we have another. This is the model that's actually cast from a human set of ventricles. And there are some interesting asymmetries present. Of course, the ventricles are going to mirror what's going on in the brain, what's going on in the um, membranes, what's going on with the bones. I worked on a woman, I think it was about 10, falling out of a second story window onto asphalt and had a traumatic brain injury as a result. The MRI showed significant difference in size between the side that had made impact that lateral ventricle compared to the, I will say unimpacted side because I don't think there was an unimpacted, but it didn't directly impact. So they can change size. Um, I'm sure plagiocephaly would affect it as well. Um, oh, and this was cool. I just read this last night, little light reading. Um, <laughs> The ventricles, they're doing research to see what the correlation is between the large ventricles and schizophrenia. 
and the cord flexi, which produce the cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles. And what they found is that um, in schizophrenia, the ventricles are enlarged. Now they don't know, is that a cause? Is that, you know, they don't know more than that at this point, but it's an interesting, interesting tidbit. Um, here I want to point out, the, the snout, shall we say, of the third ventricle is where the pituitary gland dangles off of. All right, so that's another reference point for you. The eye, you may be wondering what that is, that's the interthalamic adhesion. It's not present in everyone, I what the percentages. But basically that's a piece of tissue that connects, uh, it, it's part of the thalamus. And the thalamus sandwiches <coughs> the third ventricle. Um, so here we've got the anterior horn, the body, posterior horn, and the inferior horn. The inferior horn, and this is in your notes too, but I want you to kind of visualize this. So when you're at the table, um, these are my inferior horns. So I have the outside wall of my inferior horn is the temporal lobe of the brain. I have the floor and the inside wall, the medial wall, is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, if you're not familiar, is involved with memory. And part of what it does is decide what's important enough to send into long-term memory. Everybody gets excited about, oh, does that mean if I work my hippocampus, then I'll remember things better? <laughs> um, and then, what I really want you to be aware of is, at the tips, the anterior tips of the inferior horn, are these, it's kind of a, a ball-shaped tissue that is the amygdala. And the amygdala is a huge piece in fear and safety. It's what, if you're walking along the path and you see a, a stick, your brain, the amygdala part of your brain, in a flash, decides, oh, is that a stick or a snake? Do I need to jump or am I okay to continue walking? It's also, um, you can think of it in terms of Vietnam vets and PTSD and the car backfiring, and is it a car backfiring or is it I'm in the jungle and it's real gunfire going on? So I have noticed in people who had a lot of trauma or who were stuck in a lot of that fight or flight that the amygdala is feels very um, on high alert, feels very um, it's holding its breath, like it's the volume on it is turned up too high. Sorry, what? Facilitated. Facilitated, yeah. Um, so that's something to be aware of, pay attention to as well. And you're sensing that through the tissues through Yeah. Yep. And this is one of the things when you can start to map the anatomy, you can get more specific about, oh, I know this person has a lot of fear and anxiety going on. I wonder what's going on with the amygdala, and you may want to check in there. Now the body may say, screw you, don't come anywhere near my amygdala, and by all means respect that. But it's just something that you can have in your mental file as I might want to check in with that. And then here you can start to see we get the cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third and fourth ventricles. So this tube here. There's the fourth ventricle, which you'll see better in the next slide. All right, so here's the fourth ventricle. So you're looking at the back. This would be a person just like this, okay? So they're facing, they have your back to you. Um, and you can notice, this isn't a dead-on photo, because I wanted you to see the third ventricle there. Um, but they're, the posterior horns are asymmetrical. There's a definite twist in this model. And 
and there we have it sitting on top of the tent and the folks in between the lateral ventricles. Beneath it. It's beneath it. I'll show, I'll have another slide that will show that. All right, so here, yeah, all right. Um, so you're looking at the left half of the brain, took out the right side, and we've got the frontal lobe here, we've got the falcs, the tent, and the thing to remember too with the tent, it's not as straight horizontal, it curves. It almost, it, it's a really fascinating mirror with the diaphragm. The diaphragm is kind of this um, parachute umbrella shape. And so we've got the folks, or the tent, I'm sorry, is also really curved. And I'll pass this around so you guys take a look at that. Um, so keep that in mind, it curves and it moves in response to what's going on with the surrounding structures, hopefully. The fourth ventricle, okay, so here we've got, here's the pons. And the pons sits, all right, we've got, here would be the frontal bone. So I took out the front of the skull. This is the occipital temporal sphenoid. So they're facing you now. The pons sits, well, never mind that they're facing you. Now they have their back to you. The pawn sits here on the back side of the sphenoid. So when you're hanging out with the sphenoid, you've got access to the pawns. It's a big respiratory center is there. And a lot of cranial nerve reflex. The fourth ventricle sits between, if the cerebellum were in, which they're not, the fourth ventricle you'd be able to see is right about here. And it's a space between the pons and the cerebellum. This structure, anyone know what that is? Corpus callosum, connecting left and right hemispheres of the brain. So that's just above the third ventricle. Here's again the snout where the pituitary gland dangles off of. Here we've got the pineal gland. So the pineal gland sits in the wall of the third ventricle in the back. And the pineal gland helps to regulate our cycles in terms of day and night, um, reproductive, mel produces melatonin. All right, I am bypassing that. All right. dynamic dance around the inside of the cranium and in, within the brain itself. Now we're going to add in the fluid piece of things before I get you guys up and moving. We have two main, well four main pathways of blood supply to the cranium. What are they? Say again? Carotid. 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 And so we got left and right carotids. It's our other Cerebral. arteries. Cerebral. Left and right vertebral, vertebral arteries. So we've got the left and right carotids that travel deep behind the SCM. They travel up to the carotid canal, which is in what bone? 
that they get lots of nutrients and lots of oxygen, which is one of the reasons why we've got four main arteries, because if something goes wrong, we've got a backup plan, which is a really good thing. We've got a lot of potential for collateral circulation, which is really also a good thing. And here you can see we've got jugular foramen. And this right here is the opening of the carotid canal. So the carotid canal opens right at the tip of that petrous ridge where the temporal and the sphenoid and the occiput, that mean place in there. And also to orient you, palpate your mastoid processes, okay? So if you have your mastoid processes, if you were to travel medially an inch and slightly angle it anterior towards the front of your head, bingo, there's your, frame, your jugular frame. And anterior. Yeah, so medially, medially, and just slightly angled toward the front of your head. So now, when you're holding your client's cranium, you can palpate mastoid and go, oh, bing, there we go. Jugular foramen. And then, yeah, <laughs> this okay. isn't. Okay, so right there. Um, and then just a little bit anterior to that is the carotid canal opening. Now we're going to move into drainage. So if we've got blood supply moving in, how does it get out? We've got Blood moving in through the capillaries, feeding the tissue, and we've got magic happening. And we have the blood entering, what? Before the venous sinuses, though. Just veins. Good old veins. So we've got veins. Then we've got the veins entering into the venous sinuses. Venous sinuses are the space created when the membrane peels off the inside of the cranium, there are channels formed between the two leaves, or the two sheets of the fascia, where they come together. So we have at the edges the venous sinuses. And you can think of them like they're channels that contain venous blood and CSF. So we have the superior sagittal sinus travels along the top edge of the faults. Conveniently, the inferior sagittal sinus travels underneath. <laughs> we have the straight sinus. The main ones are the superior sagittal sinus and the straight sinus contain the most. The deep cerebral veins empty into the straight sinus. And then we've got this general flow back towards inside your external occipital protuberance where they meet. We have what's called the confluence of the sinuses. Then we've got traveling laterally along the edges of the tent, transverse sinuses. And then down the chute, out the internal jugular vein. Alright, so I'm going to pass this around. It's got the carotids and the jugular vein. The vast majority of blood exiting, blood and CSF exiting the cranium makes its way out through the internal jugular vein which depends upon that space being present between temples and the occiput. Now here's the thing. Obviously, we have drainage happening in the vast majority of us or we have big problems. 
<laughs> but there's a difference between optimal drainage and good enough we can manage drainage. Okay? So check in with that because I'm all fine. I'm a big fan of optimal over <laughs> good enough. And here we've got the left transverse sinus making its way out around that horizontal edge of the tent on the occiput, along the petrous ridge of the temporal, and down through the chute of the jugular foramen. Those sinuses are like little channels with CSF in them? They contain blood and CSF. It's drained, it's ready to drain out. And they also contain interstitial fluid, which we'll get into in just a minute. Mm -hmm. Go, oh, back to the heart. Yeah. All things lead to the heart eventually. There's the jugular foramen, and there's the opening of the carotid canal. All right. And then here's another view. All right, I just want you to have this picture in your mind, okay? That there's a lot of blood supply to the brain and drainage out. The orange are the arteries and the green are the veins. And you can see the green outline, the membranes. So there's the superior sagittal sinus there. And there's another view. And this, keep it also in mind, this doesn't include the capillaries. So these are just the big guns, but the capillaries um, are huge. And I forget, there's like a minuscule amount of brain tissue um, that is not directly, or the amount of brain tissue that does not directly meet a capillary is minuscule. If you imagine when you pull a, a plant out of the ground and all those little rootlets, that's what it looks like inside the brain with the capillaries. There's that much feeding going on to the brain tissue. All right. I stumbled upon, on LinkedIn, there was this big discussion about CSF and what gets, how does it drain? And we've got um, what a lot of us were taught was the upledger model of drainage out through arachnoid granulations, that there are little bulges of the arachnoid membrane into the venous sinuses, and there are one-way valves, and when the pressure of the CSF hits a certain level, the valves open, CSF passes into the venous sinuses, the valves close to prevent any backwash, and bada boom, bada bang. <laughs> However, <laughs> that they're just, they're realizing there's more to it. And that while some CSF may drain out of arachnoid granulations, it's by no means the entirety of it, and it may not even be the majority of it. And part of what they're finding is that um, there are, they've done injections of molding. The science is fascinating. Um, and what they're finding is that Number one, let me back up. There's no lymph system in the brain, but they've wondered why is there no lymph system in the brain? Because certainly there needs <coughs> to be an exit path for junk from the brain. What they're finding is that the CSF, as you may know from watching the lymphatics video, the CSF is has a lymphatic role within the brain. And what they're also finding is that CSF is draining out through lymphatic channels. They're finding CSF in the deep cervical lymph nodes. They're also finding that one of the places for drainage is the cribiform plate, the lymphatics in the cribiform plate and the nasal mucosa are an area where we've got drainage and they've injected molding and they did it in sheep and dogs. They also did it in humans, which Allison, I didn't think they'd done it in humans yet, but um, I was reading more last night and they found it. 
um, so the deep cervicals, and start to think about the relevance of this, the frontal. If, if we've got CSF drainage and a significant amount coming out through the cribriform plate uh, in the um, lymphatic vessels through that area, Number one, the first thing I thought about was people who play soccer and head the ball right there. Um, although I had a conversation with my osteopath about this, who he's coached soccer, and he <laughs> does cranial osteopathy, great, great guy. Um, and I was asking, I said, come on, is it even possible to head the ball and not do damage to your cranium? And he said, yeah, it is, it is possible. You have to hit it just right. And he, he says you can toughen up the dura mater to be able to withstand the impact. Now, my question is, is that really, do we really want to be doing that still? But nonetheless, any impact that you have here, compression, how might that affect drainage? Obviously, we've got other areas that cover drainage, but pay attention to what's going on here in the nasal frontal ethmoid area in terms of drainage. Yeah? This has really gotten me going because I'm really into like um, orofacial um, bone development mm -hmm. and our lack thereof in the, in the lack of our nutrition over mm -hmm. human species mm -hmm. and how we're perhaps that is impacting the drainage of our CSF through a cribriform because we're getting this narrowing and heightening um, and just lack of bone development in the area. Right, yeah, I, I don't know. That raises a, an interesting interesting question if, and observation. Is it up to 90% could be draining through the cribriform? Is that what some are saying? That's what some are saying. Um, I don't know, here's the thing. Research is great, it's wonderful, but there are so many variables. You gotta look at how the study was done. What were they really measuring? What were, um, sometimes we come to conclusions that aren't accurate because there are, we don't know what we don't know. And so I look at research and I think, okay, that's interesting. What do I notice when I go back to my table? What do I notice under my hands? Uh, I try not to write anything in stone when I read research, although it's easy to get very excited. Mm -hmm. um, so then I came across, just to add another piece into the mix, um, I came across this guy, Dan Gretzkreitz, I don't know how to pronounce his name, um, PhD out of the Department of Neurobiology in Stockholm, Sweden. And he blew everything out of the water, and his big thing is that the vast majority of, number one, of CSF, 60% of it is contained within the subarachnoid space, only 40% within the ventricles. All right, so, okay. But then it was this next piece that totally rocked my socks. <laughs> <laughs> So he's talking about cerebral spinal fluid production. What have we been taught? What produces cerebral spinal fluid? Choroid plexus. Choroid plexus. Uh, yes. <laughs> now look at this. He's saying 12% of CSF is, pro is produced by a choroid plexi. And he's saying that the vast majority, 88%, is moving out of the capillaries into the brain tissue, which I thought was fascinating, especially when we look at the lymphatics film, which has a similar story theme going on. What's that film? I'm going to show it in just a minute. Here's the thing. I totally spaced on including links to this in your handout, and I apologize for that. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to send you the links to this Dan Gritz. He's got a a whole PowerPoint presentation. I can't make sense of all of it, but there's some cool stuff in it. Um, and I, you know, if you want to know about CSF research, I've got plenty of articles to entertain you for a long time. That please share with me what you make of. <laughs> um, so keep keep that piece in mind. Here's the old model that we've got the layer of membranes and projections of the arachnoid here into the venous sinus and drainage that way. Can you just repeat the, the, the updated? Possible, Possible. Up, 
updated oh, version. Okay, variation on the theme. Is that the capillaries, production of CSF, CFF, CSF moves out of the capillaries and probably there's also um, endothelium that, lie, that surrounds the capillaries and is also involved in secreting CSF. So it's not just um, a diffusion process. There's also a um, secretion process that occurs. So just know the capillaries are now being considered to play an important role in CSF production among some scientists. This is not like been agreed upon by everyone. <laughs> and now I'm going to show you. So how much controversy then is over this finding? Well, the thing is, it's not number one. Not a lot of people are paying attention to it. I mean, cranial therapists get really excited about it because it's what we do. What the research is mostly looking at and why it's relevant to them is in, under the context of hydrocephaly. And they're trying to figure out what's causing hydrocephaly, why are some kids responding to shunts, why are other kids not. That, that's the context that a lot of this is growing out of. All right, so I want to show you. All right, this is a summary of the new. Uh -oh. Top functioning properly. Do you want big sound? Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Shows that the CSF goes into the brain just like people thought before, but it actually does so along very yep. specific anatomical structures. There's specialized, a specialized anatomy. You highly metabolic reactive. The brain cares an awful lot about what its environment is like. If it's off just a little tiny bit, it stops functioning properly. But we showed that the CSF goes into the brain just like people thought before, but it actually does so along very specific anatomical structures. There's specialized, a specialized anatomy that allows the, C the CSF to move very quickly and very deep into the brain exchanging with the fluid that's inside the brain and then moving out. So it's a much more efficient system for clearing the, the fluid and the waste out of the brain. We injected fluorescent tracer into the CSF or the fluid that surrounds the brain and watched to see where it went. The fluid as it moves down the artery is able to move right into the brain tissue. As it moves into the brain tissue, Eventually, if you look long enough, where it collects is at the other end, at veins, which are another part of the circulation. And once it reaches those veins, it's able to drain out of the brain along the outside of the veins. As the fluid sort of courses between those two, in along the arteries, through the tissue, out along the veins, that continuous flow sweeps along particles that are sitting in between the cells. Amyloid beta is a protein. All right, I'm going to pause it here. Their research, they were looking at it in the context of Alzheimer's and the impact of it on that. Um, that's not entirely relevant to our discussion today, so for the sake of time, I'm going to let you, if you think that is made and and see that. That, uh, Secreting from that space right there is what structure is that? So we're looking. All right. So we've got the art. We've got arteries in the subarachnoid space that then dive deep into the brain tissue, and there are channels, sheaths that surround the arteries that the CSF, which is in the subarachnoid space travels down alongside the arteries, and then it passes out, and it travels, it mixes with the interstitial fluid in the spaces. 
it travels around the brain cells, and those little black dots are what they call solutes. Uh, amyloid B, B is what they're in this diagram. And it acts as a kind of a flushing, so along with the interstitial fluid, the CSF kind of helps to flush away those solutes, and then it moves into these sheets that surround the veins, and then the veins feed into the um, venous sinuses along with the sheets. So the CSF and the venous sinus, or the veins, drain into the venous sinuses. Does that make sense? All right. <coughs> now, you will notice, he said they injected a tracer into the subarachnoid space. And he said in the beginning, you know, CSF is produced like we think it is. But how do we know? You know, I read this, the whole study. They don't talk about the vent. They're, they're making an assumption about the ventricles that they didn't really look at specifically in this study. And like I said, I find it fascinating that along with what Gretz was saying in terms of the CSF passing out of the capillaries, that looks an awful lot like through here. So it's almost like we've got different pieces of the elephant, but we're still working on getting the whole elephant. So capillaries go through that whole segment. Yep. Yeah. So the red could be the flush. Yes. All right, I want to show you a handful of dissection slides. Um, as Allison mentioned, these, Allison and I took this class together. Highly, highly recommend it. It's great. Um, the cadavers that were used were fresh frozen, so unembalmed, um, as lifelike as we will ever get to see. And did so you do a dissection or was it pre-done? Um, some of it was pre-done, some of it we did. The, well, I'm not gonna. What's the class? Uh, it's a dissection class. A cranial sacral therapist got connected to a lab in Baltimore, Maryland, and so she's got access to specimens. And if you want more information, yeah. shoot me an email, and I'll. I don't remember her. What, do you remember her wife's website? Up? No, but it's Julie McKay. Julie McKay. Julie McKay. But what she's got a. It's McKay something. Oh. Google? Yeah, like but it's kind of, might try that, but, or email me and I'll send you So here we're looking at the underside of the parietals, and we've got the, the faults here. And what I really want you to notice are the fibers. Yeah. Look at the arrangement of the fibers that they anchor. And the fibers are going to mirror the tension patterns that were put on the tissue. Here, we're looking at the underside, so we're on the inside of the occiput. Here we have the, the tent, and we've got the folks cerebri. So the cerebellum sits left half, or sorry, right half there, left half there. And you can see, as Allison mentioned, that strain pattern through the folks cerebri as it anchors the underside of the tent. How old do you know the age of that cadaver? I think he was in his 60s, but I don't know why I'm saying that. We really didn't get to know. I know it was a male. We don't know cause of death. We didn't get to find that much out. Yeah. I'm just trying to orient here. So the the left side of the tent is still attached there, sort of up by your left. Correct. And the right side is yep. attached when we're looking at it. Okay. Yep. So here's the left side of the tent. Here's the right side of the tent. And it's lift, she, yeah, she's lifting them up, membrane there, and that's the underside of the folks. Here you can see, so you're looking at the inside of the occiput. So here we've got the right half of the occipital lobe, the left half of the occipital lobe, right half of the cerebellum, left half of the cerebellum. Here we go. So it's just so it's just looking straight straight down. 
you're looking in. So if if you cut off the front of my head and I tipped forward a little bit, you're looking at it like this. Um, no, that's actually the pituitary. Um, you would think it's the foramen magnum, but um, it's not the right. The foramen magnum is, is back there. It's just a weird angle, but the foramen magnum, if you could look over the sphenoid, would be right there. Here you can see. So now they're lying on the back of their head. So this is like treatment position. So here we've got the roof of the orbits, the shelf of the frontal bone. We've got the fulcs anchoring here on the cribriform plate. We've got the anterior lobes of the temporal bone sitting there in the greater wings of the sphenoid. Pituitary, traveling down, foramen magnum, so that's where the spinal cord, brainstem passes through. Here we have the edges of the tent. And keep in mind, see how the membrane layers and covers the whole, it lines that whole cranium. Mm -hmm. And you can see how it butts up against the bone, mm -hmm. right? So that's the layer of the dura <coughs> that makes up the bone, or that lines the bone. What's striking to me, Lisa, is how much continuation there is of the dura down into the spinal column. I mean, it's, we, you know, we think about these things as being separate structures, right. but they're really right. not. They're very continuous yep. with one another. Yeah. There's a close-up of the anterior connection on the cribriform plate, the chrysogalli, I should say, of the folks. So again, this is where some people are saying this is a big drainage area for CSF. Uh, into, into the lymphatics of the olfactory. Because your olfactory nerves pass through their little foramen, little openings in the curved plate where the um, olfactory nerves pass through. And this, this was just, I thought, cool. So you're sucking in here. Look at that. Mm -hmm. That's the folks. It's like one of these things is not like the other. Yeah. It doesn't belong. It's a calcification. Oh, wow. This hard, nubby thing enclosed within the fascia of the folks. What is it? I don't know. That's a calcification. Big ass restriction. AKA, yes. And bones are created with extension. Yeah. Well, are yeah. they grow? You gotta have the right cells there to develop to create bone. So why? I don't know why. I don't know if it was a chemical thing. I don't know what medications he may have been on. I have no idea all the different variables that could have factored into this. How so beautiful is that tissue? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. That was all dura monitor that we were seeing. Uh, dura monitor and, yeah, it wasn't any fault or arachnoidopia. Correct. So right. What was striking me is how much it was like the here Yeah, I mean, it, it lines, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's, it's not a free fluid sac. That's why when Michelle said, yeah. where is there space? Um, is CSF in contact with the dura? It's not. It's coming away. Yeah. All right. How much time, if any, do I have left? Um, oh, really? Awesome. All right. Let's stand up, folks. Movement is good. Yep. All right, so what I want to, to do is make sure you've got um, space around you to be able to do this and not whack your neighbor. And this. So can you do this and not whack your neighbor? All right, good.
Um, who here, or in like capital O, who's familiar with Dan Sashiva in here? What? Dan Sashiva. Who kind of knows Sashiva? I was just, just talking just about a little this bit. on the way in. All right. I know the basics. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so. <laughs> Dance of Shiva is, um, incidentally, for those of you in Portland, you've got the number two instructor in the world who is here, who is um, Javi Brooks. Oh, and Danielle Cornelius. Yes, Danielle, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, so, Dance of Shiva has been described as yoga for the brain. The whole purpose of Dance of Shiva is a series of eight arm positions, and there are legs, we're not going to get into legs, we're going to do arm positions. The whole purpose of it is to scramble your brain, to confuse your brain. And it, what I have found, I, I'm integrating it more and more in my work with therapists, it gets yourself out of your way and it opens up new awareness and new neural connections. So we're going to play with this. Also, you're supposed to make mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> right. Which can be really, really hard for those of us who are perfectionists. I think about it. I'll be the one to get it right. <laughs> you may be, but that's not the point. You want to me mess up because that's what scrambles the brain. So the whole point is to scramble the brain. All right. So we've got what are called four horizontal positions and four vertical positions. So we've got horizontal one, palms. Facing the ceiling, elbows bent, parallel to the floor. Horizontal two, just below your belly button, palms again facing the ceiling, palms flat. Horizontal three, now this one can be a little less comfortable, elbows bent. There you go, bend your elbows. Ideally, you want this parallel, yeah. Now, for some people that won't be comfortable, do not sacrifice comfort for arm position, okay? Because the purity of the position is not really the most important thing. So do what you need to do to be comfortable. And four, all right? So we got one, two, three, four. That's it, yes. <laughs> Above your head, palms to the ceiling. One, two, three, four. If you're making mistakes, you're doing it perfectly. One. Now we're going to reverse it. Four, three, two, one. I'm totally doing perfect, right? <laughs> one. All right, shake your arms out. Now we're going to do the horizontal. There's four basic, sorry, vertical. Four basic verticals. So if you've got one, backs of the hands together, two, elbows bent, you're right around your xiphoid process. All right, good. Now you're going to turn your arms out and get, that's it, three, and then open it out, slightly angled back, four. Okay, so we've got one. Two, three, four. One. Now reverse it. Four. Three. Two. One. Four. You're doing it for Three. Two. One. All right. Shake your hand. Go team. <laughs> Our positions. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> so we have tent, bulks, ventricles, fluids, fluids. fluids. tent, tent. false, false. Ventric ventricles, fluids. fluids.
Trampoles. Trampoles. Frontals. 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 Spheroid. Temporals. Frontals. Spheroid. Frontals. Spheroid.
chair making contact. And just notice <coughs> your breath as it moves in. And you expand, and as you exhale, and your ribcage softens and your belly softens. With your awareness, I want you to travel up to the inside of your cranium and tune into the fascial lining of your cranium, the dura that lines the inside of your bones. And track to where it peels off from the inside of your cranium and the two left and right sheets come together to form the faults and the horizontal sheets come together to form the tent. And just notice what does this balance feel like through these membranes. Do you notice one more easily than another? Feel a pull of tension? Do you feel ease, expansion, pliability? Just notice the qualities that are present here through your membrane system. And then bring your awareness to the base of your skull, the frame and magnum within your occiput. And follow that fascial tube down through your vertebral column. Follow the dura down through your cervical vertebrae, through your thoracic vertebrae, and through your lumbar vertebrae. And then down through that canal contained within your sacrum, the sacral canal. And track the, the dura as it blends and wraps around the coccyx and then feeds into fibers of that periosteum of the coccyx, blend into the pelvic floor. And with your awareness now, hold the entirety of that membrane. So you've got the whole dural membrane surrounding the brain, the tent and the folks, and the dural tube. See if you can hold with your awareness the entirety of that structure. And notice how it balances and harmonizes as you hold the entirety of it. And then from, we'll shift your awareness back to, we'll bring it to your heart area and just notice the beat of your heart within your rib cage, as it's nestled between your left and right lungs. And follow off of the, the aorta that comes off the heart, follow off the arch of the aorta, the internal carotids that travel along the left and right sides of your neck, and also the vertebral arteries that pass through the transverse processes of your cervical vertebrae. These four arteries that travel up the carotids, passing through the carotid canal of your temporal bones. The vertebral arteries passing through the frame and magnum of your occiput joining together to form the basilar artery. And then feel, just with your awareness, feel how the arteries branch off of these main ones and become smaller and smaller into little capillaries traveling through the brain tissue. 
and from the brain tissue, start to be aware of the sheath that surrounds these arteries as they penetrate down into the brain tissue. That sheath that the CSF flows into from the subarachnoid space. And feel the CSF as it exits that sheath and filters in around all of the nooks and crannies and cells of your brain. Just like water filling a sponge. Feel how juicy your brain is. And just notice where does it feel really juicy? Where would it like more juice? What's the fluid communication like through these tissues here? And also notice the cleansing that happens as the CSF flows into the brain tissue, how it's flushing and gently carrying away anything that's not needed. And then from these capillaries, it's passing to meet the veins and the channels that surround the veins. And how the CSF and the interstitial fluid are now in the channels of the brains and they're now <clears throat> draining into the venous sinuses that are present along the edges of your folks and your tent. Feel those venous sinuses as they fill with fluid and feel the fluid drain from the front to the back just inside your external occipital protuberance of your occiput. And then feel the fluid traveling along the left and right sides of the back of your head through the transverse sinuses. And then down through the jugular veins just inside your mastoid processes of your cranium. Once again, the fluid is now returning back to the heart. And allow yourself with your awareness, see if you can hold both the arterial fluid and the venous fluid as an entire system in the cranium. And notice what that's like as it balances arterial flow and venous drainage along with the CSF flow through the tissues. And then take a nice breath. Just allow your awareness to return back to the room. Feel your feet, feel your hips. Go ahead and rub your hands, your palms together. And place one hand over your belly button, one hand over your sacrum. And just take a nice breath into your hands, feeling the expansion. And softening with the exhale. All right, welcome back. And on that note, we're time now. Okay, so thank you so much. It was a delight.